everyone, this is Ben, and you're watching Uncharted X. When you're walking around and looking at ancient sites, trying to find the specific signs of ancient high technology can be quite a difficult endeavor. These clues, these indicators that something very advanced indeed seems to have been happening at some point deep in antiquity. For example, the evidence of ancient machining or the clinical precision that is so often seen in ancient boxes and statues and megalithic architecture. These clues can quite often be very hard to find. Much of the time they're in or they're under or they're layered in amongst construction work that's of a much more primitive nature. However, there is one place that these indicators of ancient advanced technology are really not very hard to find at all, where they seem to pop out at you from almost anywhere you look. And this is a place that hardly anybody gets to visit. It's been closed to the general public for more than 100 years. It's the Old Kingdom site of Abu Sia in Egypt. On this ancient pyramid site, there are machined surfaces almost everywhere you look. There are giant megalithic blocks of granite and of basalt and of limestone. There are the remnants of huge symmetrical single piece granite columns. There are obelisks here. There are many highly advanced tube drill marks at Abu Sia just astonishing marks that have been cut into granite and other extremely hard stones. There is the evidence and markings for gigantic and what seems to be very thin circular saws that have been used to cut these massive blocks of basalt. There are also strange precision carved slabs. And the site even has a confusing and very complex subfloor conduit and plumbing system. And interestingly, Abu Sia also has a pair of giant single piece precision carved granite boxes that are housed in an underground chamber. And these boxes have some very unique features relative to all the other boxes you can see in Egypt. Before I get into the details of Abu Sia, I want to spend just a minute to frame the discussion with some context. It's something I try to do in all of my content. I've talked about these topics in much more detail in other videos, there are some links below. And if you've heard this before and you just want to go straight to the site investigation, skip ahead to around six minutes in. These examples of ancient advanced technology at Abu Sia, they simply don't match the known capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians. And they certainly don't match the tools that we found in the archeological record. Yet at the same time, it's also clear that the dynastic Egyptians occupied and they built on this site. Their work, their somewhat more primitive style of construction, and their inscriptions into the stone are everywhere. So what does this mean? Why are there clearly multiple levels of technology? And it's not only this site, or simply sites that are in Egypt. We find the evidence for multiple levels of technology at many of the megalithic remains that exist in so many other places all around the world. We have advanced and sophisticated megalithic walls that are holding up much more primitive construction work, much like here at Alante Tambo in Peru. Or these amazing megalithic walls that are holding up a bunch of mortar and mud brick constructions at the temple of Wiracocha. We have primitive writing that's been etched into some very sophisticated objects, like these giant polished boxes in the Serapium. I've talked a lot about those. Or you could simply compare the quality of the writings on this statue to the quality of the statue itself. A list of examples of multiple levels of technology on ancient sites or on ancient objects could go on and on. I look at many of them in the videos on this channel. A constant and perplexing aspect of this fact is that what you see is that the most advanced technology, the most precise work, the largest work, all of this seems to be always on the oldest sites. It seems to be in the deepest layers of construction that is found on these places. This is a real contradiction to the known story of history, yet this undeniable evidence seems to hint at a much more complex story. It really hints at much longer timelines when it comes to human civilization. It hints at the concepts of inheritance and of renovation, and it seems to suggest that multiple civilizations may well have occupied and worked on these places during the millennia of the past. Over the last 20 years, this hypothesis for a technologically advanced ancient precursor civilization, one that was far more ancient and far more advanced than those we currently accept in mainstream history, this theory has only become stronger and much more plausible with the correlation of a lot of new scientific evidence that's come up in fields outside of archaeology. 
New DNA findings have shown us that much more complex human interactions existed in the past. We've got the radical extension of the human timeline going back now hundreds of thousands of years longer than previously thought, as well as the now overwhelming evidence for massive cataclysms at the end of the last ice age, most notably the Younger Dryas cosmic impact. All of these new scientific discoveries and new scientific work is lending strength to this hypothesis. This idea of a lost ancient civilization is also supported by what almost all ancient cultures say about their own history. Origin stories almost universally involve cataclysm, and they talk of older times, more ancient times, where more advanced or more capable beings walk to the planet. And then of course we have the contradictions that come to us from the clearly advanced technology that's being used in the construction of various ancient objects and architecture. In this video, I want to explore just one of the many astonishing aspects of high technology that exists here. We're going to take a look at the pair of remarkable and quite unique precision boxes. These boxes are housed in the underground section of what is known as the Mastava of Patashepsis. And look, I'm sure I'm murdering that name, so go easy. So in any case, please give the video a thumbs up and do leave a comment. It really helps me out with the YouTube algorithms. And if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to get notified when new content comes out. I definitely plan to take a closer look at the other aspects of this site in future videos. Abu Sir is located sitting amongst all of the other pyramid sites of what's known as the Sun Belt, the line of various pyramid sites that stretch more or less north to south along the Nile in Egypt. You can see here looking north from Abu Sir, which has multiple pyramids, you can see the pyramids of Giza. South from Abu Sir, you can actually see the Step Pyramid of Djoser. And further south from that, you have the area of Dashur, which has the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. Getting there isn't too bad. You kind of have to battle the Cairo traffic for a little while, which can always be an experience. It can take an hour or two to get out there. It is true that the site's been closed to the general public for more than 100 years, but it is possible to visit. It takes a special permission and a fairly hefty fee. It's actually pretty awesome because lots and lots of groups tend to be going to this site now. So more and more people do get to see it, but you can't just turn up there and expect to buy a ticket as you might when you go up to Giza. It does take a little bit of fandangling to be granted access to Abu Sir. It's quite a lovely neighborhood that sits right next to Abu Sir. There are small estates out here, a lot of greenery and gardens. There are stables and those types of things. This neighborhood is right next to the pyramids themselves. I've actually seen plenty of people riding horses in the dunes, driving buggies, and the local children actually use these sites as a playground, which I think is pretty cool. I've visited this place and its sister site, Abu Jarab, which is right next to it, at sunset on a couple of occasions, and it's quite a surreal experience. Every time I've been there, the site has pretty much been empty, but it's been the domain of a lot of new research from the Czech Institute of Archaeology in recent years. There are several papers from that institute that you can find of recent excavations and some work that's been done over the past couple of decades. The area we're focusing on today is the Mistaba of Ptashepsis, and this is located kind of to the left of the first pyramid, the entryway, the way that most people gain access to the site. Behind the Mistaba, there are a couple more pyramids and more courtyards. I think the whole place was more or less a pyramid complex, and it's all connected. As you can see, this mastaba was once an underground construction, and it would have had a roof and probably other mastabas built right on top of it. Right now, it's all open to the sky, and it does tend to fill up with sand, so everything you see here has kind of been exposed to the elements for, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of years. Even orthodox archaeology will tell you that there was at least three phases to the construction of this site. I think it's quite likely that the original underground megalithic structure is actually far older than that and then the site was worked on by the early dynastic Egyptians, in this case the 5th dynasty. It was most certainly used as a tomb for Ptashepsis. He was the vizier for the 5th dynasty pharaoh Nusara and he was also his son-in-law as he married Nusara's daughter and this was a sign that maybe Ptashepsis was also quite likely of the royal bloodline himself. We know this because of the inscriptions that are left to us on the site. And if you've seen my videos before, you'll know that I think a lot of these inscriptions and the hieroglyphs were actually added in much later periods. Periods certainly well after the construction of the original megalithic cores to these sites. An interesting side note on this is the pointy skirt, if you notice in this drawing of Ptashepsis. And this tends to be an indicator of importance or of relevance. When you see glyphs with pointy skirts on them, the bigger or the pointier or the more dramatic the actual skirt is, it relates directly to how important that person was. In this case, Ptashepsis was the vizier or the grand vizier, and that's essentially the hand of the king, if you like your references Game of Thrones style. 
As you can see walking through here, there are several chambers. There's also a room with a number of pillars. Looking down, you can see that the boxes themselves were housed in what must have been an underground chamber. Accessing this chamber is a little bit of an adventure. There is a very short but a very familiar descending passageway, one that matches almost exactly, just feels that way to me, exactly the dimensions of many other pyramid structures. It's a three foot by three foot tunnel that descends down, and in this case, there's no stairs, there's no wooden rails. You have to kind of shuffle down there. You can see Luke demonstrating it here. It's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Throw a bit of sand down and kind of slide down on your heels. As you can see, there are two precision carved granite boxes with lids in this chamber. The fact that there are two of them is slightly interesting. If this was indeed a tomb for Ptarshepsis, then how come he needs two boxes? How many sarcophagus does a dead guy need after all? One box is smaller than the other and it has a quite heavily damaged lid, but this box is incredibly interesting to me because it has what appears to be a limestone in a layer. There's actually a box in a box. This limestone in a layer is a single piece box in and of itself, and it perfectly fits in the dimensions of the granite outer box. It's really astonishing, and you can see where it's been damaged and this piece of the limestone has broken away. You can see the granite face, and you can just tell how tight and precise that fit was. It's, uh, it's quite perplexing. This damage has happened relatively recently to this box. I have found some black and white photos of this site that actually show the lining to be more intact than what it currently is. But, I mean, it's open to the elements, anything can happen. The larger box is also very interesting. It reminds me a lot of the Serapeum boxes. Both of these objects are made from rose granite, likely granite that's been shipped up from Aswan, which is 500 miles away. And as you can tell, being open to the elements, sand blows in, the occasional rainstorm, these boxes would get wet, they're exposed to the weather. When you take the time to clear away some of this sand, some of this dust and debris, the finish on the granite is just astonishing. The polish is still very evident and the surface just feels really smooth to the touch. Even the limestone seems to be finished to a relatively high degree. We uh, got pretty good at making a little bit of mud here. You can clearly see what this box may have looked like in all of its glory and you can see the contrast with the limestone in a box. I haven't seen any other examples of these types of things that have those inner boxes. It's a really interesting and unique aspect to me. And the larger box itself also looks to be very well made. Just very flat surfaces, very precise cuts. Unfortunately, you can't really get at it. It doesn't appear to have anything in it. The lid has been propped up. These boxes aren't quite the same size or scale as those in the Serapium. It does seem possible that they've been moved around. It's also evident that there is multiple levels of technology being used in the masonry here. There are several different styles of construction. There is clearly quite a lot of megalithic work here. You can see the bottom layers and a just gigantic block that sits above the entrance to this chamber. You can see cruder forms of masonry, likely done by the dynastic Egyptians in their renovations on this site. And then some more of the work is pretty obviously modern, or might have been done in the Greek-Roman time. And of course, none of this work matches the precision or the sheer scale of the megalithic work, which is at the lowest layers, which means it's the oldest. A good example is the precision shown in the masonry of the small tunnel that you have to then crawl back out of on your hands and knees. This is a very interesting section of Abu Sia, and I find it to be very similar to Mastaba 17 at my doom, which we find sitting next to the so-called pyramid. The layout of the box chamber in Abu Sir is almost identical to what we find under the Mastaba here at Maidum. We just don't have the mud brickwork that sits on top of the megalithic construction. You can see that this work that sits on top of the ground is actually quite primitive. Yet take a look at the megalithic chamber that's actually built underneath it and you have to go through a series of tunnels to get in there. This megalithic chamber at my doom, it also has a precision carved granite box that must have been put down in this chamber before the rest of the site was built. So here we have yet again another great example of some very primitive construction that sits on top of very sophisticated and precise megalithic work. It really begs the question, why was it done this way if it was supposed to be a single civilization that built it and in a single time period? Logic tells us that the bottom layer, the more advanced masonry work, had to have happened first. So how is it that the technology level regressed so much when it came time to build the structure on top? To me, this is a clear indication of inheritance and reuse. 
The later culture, the dynastic Egyptians, they obviously respected and revered this more ancient work, but they weren't able to match the high technology nature of the megalithic construction. We see the same sort of thing all over the world and I really don't understand why more of our mainstream academics don't actually address this point and investigate it. It seems to me that the technological angle of this work is seriously worthy of some further scientific study. Well, I hope you enjoyed that brief look at a part of Abu Sir. There's just so much to talk about. On this site, I will definitely feature a lot of it in upcoming videos. I ended up writing out a long analysis of the precision nature of a lot of the boxes that you find across all of ancient Egypt, but I think I'm gonna leave this video here and make that its own piece of work. I'm also working on many of the other projects that I've mentioned recently, new Younger Dryas work, my investigation into Puma Punku and Tiwanaku. I also have some really interesting interview guests lined up, so lots more to come. I want to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters and all of my patrons. The only reason this channel exists is because of you guys and the value for value model. So if you like the work that I'm doing, please do consider visiting unchartedx.com support to find out all about it. And I will see all you guys in the next video. Peace.